reference to the tensorial code. It's in that area. It's on the bottom so if that of the does cerebrum. So it's start swelling, then it'll start cutting off that blood circulation as it's, well. It's more, it may, it may. It's more kind of around um, that tentorial plate area. It's kind of in a circle. Okay. There was, uh, at another school I worked at, I had a brief, I had the opportunity of a brief having a VR program for um, briefly when I was doing some patho stuff. And it was really cool because the students could look through some um, virtual reality glasses and they could actually walk inside, inside the brain and look up at mm -hmm. the cranial nerves and kind of look around at all the structures. It, it gave one appreciation for all the crap that's up there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff up there. <laughs> okay, traumatic brain injury. Remember Friday, I talked a little bit about understanding mechanism of injury when it comes to like a motor vehicle accident. Somebody's, you know, they're, they're, they're lap belted in, they're driving, but when they have their motor vehicle accident, the head goes forward, it probably bumps into the steering wheel, and then it goes back, and then it comes, it comes um, you know, it comes to rest again. That kind of injury is called a coup contra coup kind of injury. The point at where the impact on the steering wheel takes place, the patient may may have more of a focus, a focal kind of kind of injury, perhaps a contusion, where there's actually some bruising going on and some and some focal or some localized bleeding, and perhaps in the back as well. But on the sides, on the in the tentorial area, there may be more of a concussive type injury where there's actually shearing forces going on. So um, there can be some neuronal damage on the sides. So those kinds of injuries, need, and, and that's not even talking about what kind of uh, spinal cord injury may happen, but that may happen in motor, motor vehicle accidents. Damage there, perhaps some damage in the back, in the back cause, causing contusions, which are bruises, versus a concussion, have the word concussion here someplace. Concussion, which is less severe, but still can have significant impact on one's life because it's more shearing forces. And that's what's happening at the sides in this illustration on the sides of the brain. So with those two types of injuries that may happen, there may be some uh, feelings of, dis of confusion, disorientation, um, concussions, people can have retrograde amnesia. They don't remember the events leading up to the, to the accident. There may also be some inability to learn going forward for a little bit of time, because remember there can be some neuronal damage depending on where the damage is actually taking place in the brain. So those kinds of assessments related to the kind of injury that was going on is gonna be really important to do frequently. There is a, um, a hospital level assessment that's done that's called SCAT-5, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, SCAT-5. Um, when the patient gets into the hospital, the assessments will include, I'm gonna read off. The assessments will include what you will have to do as a nurse is assess memory. You'll just ask them some questions. That doesn't seem like Spanish Inquisition or anything, but you know, what do you remember in the events leading up to the accident? Um, doing the Glasgow Coma Scale. Who knows what's in the Glasgow Coma Scale? You're looking at wakefulness, you're looking at pain response, you're looking at um, ability to follow commands. So you'd probably do a Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, C-spine, C-spine protection, clearly we worry about protecting the nerve cells that are in going down that, the vertebra. So C-spine protection until it's cleared. Looking at cognitive function, neural function, balance, any kind of delayed reaction. So those neuro checks in the hospital, there'll be a checkoff sheet, sheet for you to follow. There's no way we're gonna remember all the little nuances of the checkoff sheet. So besides, we have to have it, you have to have it documented. So there'll be something in the clinical information system, an itemized uh, list of things to assess to see what's going on. Um, sports injuries. 
repeated concussions with folks that have had sports injuries can lead to those little repeated neuronal damages that can happen, um, can lead to maybe early onset dementia. Uh, my nephew, six feet seven, his neck is this big, um, did state high school sports. Uh, he got a scholarship to go to, a bunch of people offered him, but he did college ball. He got hurt so many times, he didn't end up doing NFL. He was offered, but in the wisdom of his aunt, his grandmother and his mother, <laughs> he didn't do um, professional ball because he just got hurt so many times. He broke so many bones. Um, what's the, I don't follow sports. What's the, who's the guy on the far end that runs and catches a lot? Wide receiver. That was it. <laughs> I knew that would trigger it. <laughs> yeah, that was him, and he was very good at what he did. But he got a, he got injured a lot. He's he had a number of concussions. And um, anybody a referee or anything? I know a referee. Okay. What what do you know about after somebody gets a concussion? What kind of things does that referee have to do for sure to make sure that that person is okay after they get a concussion? Yeah, there's, I, I, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know there is a specific, they get tested on it. Referees just have to do annual tests, I guess. But yeah, there are, there are specific things that have, they have to do to make sure that that kid is okay to play ball again or not. Right. And, and if they're out, just, they're out. So that's why you just send to the athletic trainer and the athletic trainer says that that's what the referee really has to do. Okay, that's probably in bigger sports and just little. And I, little league, I think, too. Yeah, and little league. Yeah, they have to do that real quick. But either way it goes, whether it's the athletic trainer because they've got more education in it, or the referee, people have to be checked out because repeated concussive injuries are not good. Mm -hmm. They have to be, and they, they should not be let back into the game. Um, what other questions? We talked about concussion, contusion. What other questions do you guys have on traumatic brain injury? People have to be checked out. They have to be given brain, what's brain rest? They have to be given brain rest, like after sports injury. No electronics. No electronics. No electronics. Yeah. <laughs> what else did you say? Light. Right, low light. Sound. Low sound, low stim environment. What'd you say? No reading. No reading. They're just supposed to sit there in the dark and do nothing. Uh, it sounds amazing. Doesn't it though? Yeah. <laughs> but it's like if you injure, if you sprain your ankle or injure your yeah. muscle in your leg, you're rested, right? Yeah. You got to do the same thing for your head. So that's what brain rest is. You must rest your brain. Think of it as a little vacation. Yeah. Reason to not do schoolwork. Questions on this? Okay, here's a little mystery case. Actually, this is a. This is a, um, when I was in a, working in a hospital, I was doing staff education, I had to review this case because it had a bad outcome. The lady died. The hospital was a ways from the city and this patient ended up, she had, a, she had an epidural hematoma and she was observed for, she wasn't observed nearly enough, um, but she was observed overnight and nursing did not check on her frequently enough. Anyway, that's a sad story. So we have a 77 year old female who fell in her, who fell in her bedroom. Um, she was getting up to the bathroom. She caught her leg and she just tripped on a rug or something like that. She did not have a loss of consciousness. Um, the side of her face was swollen a little bit because she hit her face. She denied having any kind of chest pain or dizziness or any cardiac signs, but it looked like she was falling a little bit at home. She lived by herself. She's got a past history of having some anemia, a uh, past history of having some hypertension, and a past history of having some osteoporosis. So when she comes into the ED, she's a little bit confused. She's oriented to person and place, but not necessarily the time, but you know, sometimes I'm not oriented to time, to time either, so that's relative. She reports pain of a four over 10 over a right temple, because that's where she hit her head. She denies any visual disturbances, double vision, shortness of breath, numbness or tingling in her face. 
and our hand grips are equally strong. So as you look at this story, um, what are some things that you're noticing? As a nurse, you want to notice what? Yeah. Well, I'm just kind of frustrated. Yeah. I see notices. Bruising. Thank you. She's bruised, yeah, because she fell on her face. So you'd notice the bruise. Sometimes people take pictures of the bruises just for medical record to, to see that it's getting better. What else are you noticing? She said she's been falling more or quite often. Um, so if this is a repetitive thing, like how many has she had is it on the same side? It's yeah, I would, if nothing else, if she ends up going home, I, I, I would get social services involved and she doesn't need to live alone anymore if she's falling a lot. That's, that's a big concern. What else? Yes. Yeah. You'd want to look at the wound that's on her face and you also want to notice right now what's normal. Right now, she's not having any visual disturbances. Right now, she's not having any uh, double vision. Right now, she's not having any shortness of breath. Because when somebody falls on their head, with an, with an older adult, a ground level fall is kind of considered a trauma. It's, it's, it's a significant thing. You're gonna notice when she's normal and when she's not normal. One thing that when, when we talk about um, taking care of somebody who's had a stroke, a new stroke, we want to know, if, this is an abbreviation, but this is what is used as the abbreviation, which you shouldn't use the abbreviation. Um, NKW, last known well. When were they last known well? Because it's very important that you notice when they start not being well. Because that probably correlates with, remember the last, the last um, slide that we watched, that we saw stage one of increasing intracranial pressure? They're normal. Their clinical manifestations are fine. They have no clinical manifestations. Stage two is when things start going downhill. So it's important that we know that when she comes to the ER, she's okay, kinda. She's got some bruises and stuff. Does that make sense about the need to know the last known well time? Okay, so we'll keep that little story in our head. We're gonna see her vital signs as she progresses in a little bit. Because right now we wanna talk about the different kinds of bleeds that can happen. So we can have something called an epidural bleed. An epidural hematoma is associated with arterial damage. Think about how quickly an artery bleeds. Is it fast or is it slow? Fast. Mm -hmm. Epidural bleeds in the head, people can go downhill very, very, very quickly. It's usually associated with a bleed from the middle meningeal artery, not always, but oftentimes. Uh, you know, Liam Neeson's wife, yeah. when she died, she died of an epidural hematoma. The story with her was that they were, they were I believe they were skiing. Yeah. She hit her head. She had a brief loss of consciousness, and that's classic with an epidural hematoma. She woke up, I mean, it was brief. By the time Liam got there, she probably, you know, passed out and then woke up. And then she was fine for a little bit. Liam, apparently Liam said, you want to go to the ED? No, honey, I'm fine. I'm fine. Got home and she died. Because it's arterial in nature, epidural bleeds go fast. As opposed to a subdural bleed, which is usually associated with a venous, with a vein that's injured. Veins are under lower pressure in our body. They're going to bleed more slowly. It could be a few days because it's a slow bleed. You're still getting the increased intracranial pressure. You're still getting the chances of herniation. It's just slower. Sometimes it can even, if it's slow enough, it can be practically subclinical. But the important thing is, is just identifying that there's an injury and identifying that if it is subdural in nature, um, it's under, it's, it's venous so it could take a little bit longer to bleed, okay? 
intracranial is someplace inside the brain tissue itself. And notice that hernia, how big this one is, we have some herniation going on. This could take three, this could take a, quite a few days too, three, 10 days, something like that. It depends, it depends on the vessel that is bleeding and just how big the vessel is. Did I see a hand up in the back? Okay. So with any of these, um, you need to know what the injury is, the last known well time is, and know that if there's a head injury, you have to watch neurological signs. And ultimately, the treatment is just what we've been talking about already, decreasing environmental stimuli. No music, no visitors, no books to read, no cell phone, no Facebook, no TikTok, no Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, it, it'll be good for you. <laughs> Decrease environmental stimuli. Increase the head of the bed to 30 to 45 degrees and try and encourage them to keep their neck straight just for that venous drainage. Okay, you don't want it to be like a little band just kind of pooling up in the head, increasing their, the pressure that's in their brain. So that's what maintain body alignment is. Okay. Um, you can try hypertonic fluid, that really high tonicity, lots of salt in the IV. It's 23%, we're talking just a little bit of, little volume of fluid. But that amount of salt in the blood vessels will totally suck any kind of <laughs> cellular fluid out. <laughs> and it'll end up in the vascular space, and then you give them a diuretic like mannitol to pee it out, okay? How do you feel about those interventions? Mm -hmm. they, they make sense? Mm -hmm. It's pretty classic. Each and every time the treatment is about the same, and then following neurological checks and understanding the, the um, the principles of automaticity with how the body responds, okay? Related to acidosis, alkalosis, watching that respiratory rate, knowing that that can affect body pH, okay? Questions on that? Okay. Well, if somebody does have an epidural hematoma, we have to get the clot out. So here's a picture of a clot that would then be evacuated from the space and that would decrease the amount of pressure on the brain tissue and decrease the chances of herniation. But we're opening up the brain so now we have increased chance of infection. And we know infection causes fluid shifts and that increases pressure as well. So this person is going to the ICU to have a bolt in their head to measure pressures inside the brain. That's just the way it's gonna go. And nursing staff will monitor those pressures very, very carefully. Nursing staff will have some parameters on what to do. If the, if the intracranial pressure is this, you're gonna do this. If it's above this, you're gonna do this, then call me. If this, then, a lot of if, then stuff. Because we need to maintain a very, a probably very, a very narrow intracranial pressure to make sure that we have adequate cerebral perfusion. Blood pressure will have to be maintained, really tight numbers and tight parameters. How do you feel about that concept? Good. Those numbers have to be really tight and really accurate and nurse and what the nurse notices is very, very important. And I know Loretta talks about it. I know your other instructors talk about the importance of noticing and then making an interpretation of what the meaning of that stuff that you notice is. That's why your understanding of patho and nursing um, information is so important. You're not just a monkey that looks at numbers and does exactly what somebody says. You have, truly have to understand the dynamics of what's going on here. So when they evacuate that hematoma, there's a big risk for infection, so you'll watch for all of those parameters as well. But um, yeah. Brain surgery is kind of, kind of blew your hair back a little bit. <laughs> there was a student that I was talking to. Um, 
she said she was she was observing um, brain surgery, and she said that Loretta has used the term. Um, no, I'm having a brain fart. Um, when you're bra liquefactive, liquefaction, necrosis. necrosis. Yeah, it's necrosis. It's it's, and what happens is because in the necrosis there's liquefaction. Well, the student actually saw liquefaction because of the necrosis and the, and the cerebral hypoxia the patient was experiencing over a long period of time because of a, some, an injury that happened. And she said when she saw, because the physician went in and debrided it and pretty much sucked out all the liquefaction, and she, she looked at me with, with these eyes that were just stunned, and she, she said, and I looked at the physician, I said, is this patient ever going to be okay? And the physician said, no, no. The brain is liquefied because of the hypoxia. There's no going back. Damage is done, and it's very sad. But that's what necrosis can. Ha that's what necrosis can do to the brain. It can actually liquefy it to the point that the 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 brain surgeon goes in and sucks out the 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 debris. And there's nothing left. Yeah. Well, what kind of quality of life do you have after that? Is it just like life support and then? Yeah, yeah. Rehab uh, in a rehab facility where they may be on a ventilator for the rest of their lives, and then their loved ones come in and see them. It's. I mean, it's really sad. That kid that I talked about on Friday, the one that was posturing when, when, um, yeah. I. That's what I meant when I said, you know, I reflect on. So we coded him, what if we had saved him? It was bleeding. More than half of his brain. That tissue is gonna die. I mean, the family gets a, gets a physical body to come visit, but he won't be the guy that he once was. So that's where medical ethics comes in and, and it's the family's and the care provider's decision what to do. I'm not saying what's right or what's wrong, because that's not me to call. But it's sad. The whole thing is very sad. Yeah. Oh, I thought your hand went up. No. Okay. Uh, questions on this? Okay. So here's our patient, our 77-year-old gal that came in. In the ED, our assessment, her blood pressure is a little bit high, but she's got a history of hypertension. She's in the ED, so it's probably going to be, I mean, shoot, it's going to be a little bit high just because she's stressed out. Her MAP is 108, it's borderline on the high side, but it's still okay. Heart rate looks okay, respirations looks okay, temps okay, stats are okay. Um, level of consciousness, she's doing okay there. Pupils are okay. Now, two hours later, what do you see that is starting to concern you? MAP's gone up. Respirations are going down. Yeah. I was going to say, it really just worked that her respiration rate was in half. And her level of consciousness is decreased. Exactly. Exactly. So her pulse is down. That's not, I'm sure that's not athletic tone down, you know, because she runs a lot. And her right pupil is like What is that? She's now on oxygen. She's now on oxygen. Her respiratory rate is very concerning. Her temperature is still okay. Her pupils are sluggish. That's very concerning. So let's go back a little bit. What do you think may be causing this pupillary issue? Let's talk physiologically. What's going on? Pressure on, the Pressure on which cranial nerve? Three. Three. The oculomotor one. Okay. That's what's causing the pupils to become a little bit sluggish. Okay. And the left pupil is starting, uh, left pupil reactive to light, and right, the right one is sluggish. So we may be seeing some herniation more on the, on the right side. Um, level of consciousness, why is her, what is causing the change in her level of consciousness? Hypoxia. Hypoxia. She's having cerebral hypoxia. The pressure pushing on different portions of the brain. That's exactly right. Now, the portion of the brain that controls um, memory and conversation is, is the cerebrum. So she's having some herniation just on the tissues in her cerebrum. O2 saturation, man, 10 liters with a face with probably a non-rebreather. 
well, it says face mask, but you probably put it on her breather on her. 84, so her stats are okay, but that's a lot of extra oxygen blowing at her. Okay. So that shows that there's some something not so good going on. What is it about maintaining normal thermia? Why is it important to maintain normal thermia with somebody with a head injury? On normal temperature. It, it actually increases cerebral metabolism if we're, hypo, if we're hyperthermic. That's why um, after, even after somebody has a cardiac arrest and they, when we bring them back, we have return of spontaneous circulation, but they're not awake. They're still kind of in a comatose state. That's why it is protocol to do something called temperature targeted management. We keep them hypothermic. We keep them at a temperature of 32 to 36 degrees Celsius because it is neurologically sparing for at least 24 hours. We let their brain rest, we let their body rest, and we have better outcomes with targeted temperature management. So we want to keep people more cool than hot because we don't want extra cerebral metabolism going on. We don't want that happening. That's just going to extend the damage, the, the cerebral hypoxia that's happening. So why is the respiratory rate going down? Pressure, pressure on the brain stem. stem. Pressure on the brain stem. That's exactly right. And it's irregular, so that's not good. We're heading towards, what term would we call of the three, was it Shane Stokes? Is it uh, central uh, neurogenic hyperventilation or is it apneustic? Abnustic, yes. This is getting really slow. Why is her pulse going down? Pressure on the brain stem. That's exactly right. And we're having, we have a widened pulse pressure here, right? There's a bigger difference between the systolic and diastolic, and the math is going up. Okay. How do you guys feel about the reason, the physiological reason for all of these changes to take place? Questions, questions, questions? Yes, ma'am. Clinically, if this was reported and there was interventions that were implemented, would this patient survive or is it? Likely, likely, yeah. as long as there are interventions that take place. Um, in this case, she had an epidural hematoma, she needed to have it evacuated. But in this case, the provider didn't get notified, the nurse didn't report, right. and so they could. She, she died in the ambulance on the, on the way to Portland, is what happened. Um, it was found, you know, that last known well time thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was hours before. They just didn't want to wake her up in the middle of the night, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. So if you found this at the two hour mark, how would you want to change? How would you, what would you want to do with her position? Set her up. Set her up. Put her at 30 to 45 degrees. What about her body alignment? Straighten, Straighten the body alignment. That's exactly right. Um, would you want to put on rock and roll music and yeah. give her her cell phone and say, look at these cool TikTok videos I found. Yeah. See this dog? Does he have bones? What is that? He has bones or no bones? <laughs> <laughs> It's a bones kind of thing. Yeah, so you want to keep that environmental stimuli really low. What kind of medications are you thinking that you want to make sure that you hear the physician suggest? Like Antipulin, Tocopris, Bartex, Novel, Acromatopris, Medication. Maybe just like keep pressure off of the thing that's inhibiting it. I, yes. What you want to do, I love what you said. You want to, you want to, Think about fixing the problem instead of the symptom as much as possible. Sometimes you do have to fix the symptom. It's a very, very important principle to remember. You want to figure out what the root cause of the situation is and fix that. Because then that will fix the plethora of other clinical manifestations that are going on. And that's kind of the same reason that when that respiratory therapist said, well, we know the patient's acidic because um, you know, they were dead and stuff, and we did CPR, so we just hyperventilated them. And I said, well, what you really want to think about doing when you're, when you're doing a cardiac arrest code kind of thing is do excellent CPR, because that produces the excellent perfusion. 
So, you know, when you do the CPR, you maintain a rate of 110 and you go down the two inches and you re relieve, you know, let it recoil enough and you have somebody to relieve you in two minutes. So please always remember, that's why this class, that's why patho is so important. Your understanding of the root cause of the issue, that's what you fix. Sometimes you want to fix the symptoms, but really you got to find out the root cause of the issue. And that's, and so you work with a primary provider and you suggest things. Oh, I understand, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that may be new information for the provider and the provider says, thank you so much. Then we'll go in this direction instead of this direction. So everybody comes to the table with data and your, and your ability to notice things is so important. So some medications that we can do to relieve this pressure. Yeah. Um, I had a question about IV fluids that you can... No, no, what oh, is, okay. that's some so, more medications. Well, on the slides, on the notes, it says that intravenous fluids should be isotonic. Um, okay. But I wondered about when we were talking about hypertonic to decrease swelling. Excellent, excellent. So isotonic fluid is, if you have to give fluid, Isotonic would be your, your fluid of choice because why? What does isotonic fluid do? What does it not do? It doesn't go into any, it doesn't go outside the vascular space. So if this person needs IV fluid, let it be isotonic in nature. Okay. If you want to cause fluid shifts, then you will purposefully give the hypertonic fluid. Let's say the physician says they've been up for 48 hours and they just looks so tired and you know you're like me when I was in the service I have to take care of my docs I have to take care of my doc so can you just go ahead and give a d5 and a quarter normal saline and just 200 an hour how would you respond to that what is d5 and a quarter which is 0.2 normal saline is that hypertonic hypotonic isotonic it's hypo. It's very hypotonic. Normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Hypotonic is anything less than 0.9. So a quarter normal saline is like 0 0.2, 0 0.23, something like that. And dextrose is sugar. It has no real tonicity, except for the bag. The body's not the bag, so once it's out of the body then, or once it's out of the bag, the body uses up glucose and then just turns into nothing. Um, so you can give isotonic fluid, you can give hypertonic fluid. What else can you do to cause some fluid shifts and get them to pee it out? Diuretic. A diuretic. Mannitol is specifically an osmotic diuretic. Lasix is a loop diuretic. It's a diuretic, but mannitol is going to be a better diuretic. Okay, what do you think about what do you think about the immediate interventions that you would do? Thank you. Does, do they all make sense with why? You have to understand why. Never, ever, I rarely say never, but never, <laughs> never do an intervention that a physician asks you to do if you don't understand the principles behind doing it, what it's doing. Because it's your license. Okay? It's it's on you. And let me tell you, the physician's going to protect themselves, so that's reality. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We've got a minute after. Alzheimer's. Okay, Alzheimer's disease is, uh, we're learning more and more and more and more and more about it. Alzheimer's disease oftentimes has a genetic predisposition. Um, classically, physiologically, there are some, I'm going to erase this because I'm going to draw something. Does everybody have what they need up here? You can also flip it over. Oh, I can, can't I? Oh, and there's also a little guy. Let me just do this one over here. Alzheimer's disease has classic physiological dysfunction. I'm going to put this right in front because that's where the camera is. <laughs> Alzheimer's thing, Alzheimer's disease is classically two things, just like it says, or three things. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to. I appreciate it. I just can't. Yeah. Okay. We've got plaque formation. Tell me what you understand these plaques to be. They cause impediment of nerve transmission. That, that's these little amyloid plaques. Okay. The things that can contribute to the amyloid plaques are, of course, the amyloid. And I want to spell it right. And amyloid and also ta protein um, byproduct kind of thing can also contribute to the growth of the amyloid plaque, but ta proteins, what do you understand? Where are ta proteins? Here's where I draw my picture. They're in the brain, specifically where in the brain. They're very cool, little connector things. They are on the little neural fibrils that are inside the nerve itself. So you've got your nerve guy. And inside the nerve are the microfibrils, this is not to scale, <laughs> are the little nerve fibers that transmit memory, transmit all of those signals, depending on the nerve, around in your brain, in, around in your brain. What keeps these little neural fibrils from tangling up are top proteins. They kind of keep things on the straight and narrow. Again, this is not to scale. <laughs> and those top proteins need to stay aligned. So it keeps the, the, uh, the little microfibril things aligned. Well, what can happen, because genetically, what can happen is these little ta, I'm gonna put that ta protein are inside, this is the nerve. The top proteins are keeping things aligned. What can happen genetically with um, Alzheimer's is these top proteins get misaligned. So if these top proteins get misaligned, what happens to the microfibril? It gets misaligned too and everything gets all tangled up. So if the microfibrils inside the nerve get tangled up, what happens to the function of the nerve? It, it gets tangled up. <laughs> yeah. So memories are lost. Names are forgotten. Grandkids are forgotten. I mean, it's sad. But that's physiologically what happens with Alzheimer's dementia. Okay. In addition, and, um, the, the amyloid plaques they're very sticky proteins. They cluster together more. Sometimes ta gets stuck in there too. But the ta is in the, the nerve itself. Additionally, there's a loss of acetylcholine. What is acetylcholine? It's a neurotransmitter. So there's a loss of uh, acetylcholine remove, or transmission. It's a neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine doesn't work like it did either. And because it's a neurotransmitter, we're not having those, those impulses transmitted from synapse to synapse anymore. So the clinical manifestations are neuron destruction. The top proteins are getting all tangled up, so they're not functioning well. Loss of cholinergic activity. What, what kind of neurotransmitter is, is uh, acetylcholine? What, what is parasympathetic? It's the main neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system. So there's memory failure, personality changes, inability to perform daily activities of daily living just because we don't have normal nerve transmission. Anybody have a relative with Alzheimer's? What kind of, what kind of clinical manifestations? What kind of variety do you guys see? Is it mostly um, memory? A lot of memory, but in the end of her life, she um, actually died because she lost all her muscle memory, even, and so she wasn't able to swallow, so she couldn't yeah. eat or drink, and that was like what eventually killed her. Yes, thank you for saying that because um, 
Well, they may have dementia. That's what my, both my parents succumbed to was dementia. It wasn't Alzheimer's. It was just, it was a vascular dementia. Again, who knows what the stroke was? Anyway, depressing. Um, they, the dementia causes the cause of the death. So, so swallowing, ADLs, yeah. What is the difference between like Alzheimer's versus this dementia? My great grandmother succumbed to dementia, okay. but she did not necessarily have the Alzheimer's piece. Right. There are several kinds, thank you for asking. It's a very, very good question. There are several different kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's is one. Parkinson's mm -hmm. is a type of dementia. Vascular dementia is very common. Vascular dementia is caused by chronic hypertension. Peripheral vascular disease. That's my plan, is vascular dementia. So you guys have to take care of me. <laughs> Just saying. Um, and because of, you know, sedentary lifestyle, just what you guys said earlier, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, mm -hmm. genetics, whatever, totally genetics on my part. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, the damage to the blood vessels causes the plaque to build up, and that's what leads to the dementia because um, of stroke. Okay. So did she have strokes in the past? You know, I don't know. All I remember is she went out happy because she was having all sorts of dates with Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she did dates. Yeah, she kept. She would tell her caregiver, "Last night Elvis took me out," or she was having a fine time. <laughs> she went out her way out. That's that's one of the benefits of dementia. Is you don't know how bad it is, and your your family's suffering. I mean, your family's suffering. I mean, I I walk that walk. It, it stinks. But the person who has the dementia, they're not who they once were. They don't have the memories. They don't, they see people. My, my mom was seeing my dad before she left. She saw her parents. She was happy. So it's very painful for the family. Incredibly painful for the family. So there's vascular dementia. There's an alcohol associated dementia. Oh my gosh. Um, there are different kinds of dementia. Um, so with Alzheimer's, I'll go real quickly. With Alzheimer's, there's brain atrophy, okay? We've already talked about some of these slides a little bit. Um, this CT scan shows which type of hematoma? Intracerebral. Intracerebral, good. And we've talked about the kinds of things that we wanted that, we, that would increase intracranial pressure. Which of these would increase intracranial pressure? Good, loud music would. Encouraging visitors. Encouraging visitors would. So yeah, we don't wanna see that happen. Steroids neurologically are debatable. It depends on the physician that you talk to. Steroids are an anti-inflammatory, so it's good, um, but it depends on the physician. Um, this kind of hem hematoma classically is, a, is an epidural hematoma because you can see the little line here. There's the dura, makes a nice clean line. So that's an epidural hematoma. And what vessel ruptures with an epidural hematoma? Artery, Artery. very good. Um, this is a traumatic brain injury, gunshot wound. So what's happening here, they're gonna have to debride that. We worry a lot about infection because all the crap that was out here is now inside the brain. So this person is gonna definitely be in the ICU with um, pressure monitoring. This is a funny slide. He had an unfortunate accident with a nail gun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know, it's like, what the heck? Um, with, with this guy, we're concerned about also um, spinal cord injury too, because this nail is probably going through his cord, so he probably can't breathe. You can see his EP tube and stuff. Uh, and then the last slide for you guys, the very last one is questions. But what you guys will then do, because it is 20 minutes after, go ahead and watch the slide on seizure disorders. Uh, they're very scary to see. Um, but yeah, that's it. We did it. Yay! And Loretta's flying home as we speak. So you will see her on Friday. Thanks, you guys. Yeah.